Hi, I'm Randy Chestnut from the University of Washington Harborview Medical Center. And I've been asked to discuss ICU management of severe traumatic brain injury. What I'm going to do here is to try to give us a view to the future rather than simply recapitulating things that have already been done and published. We have 15 minutes, so hold on. In the 50s and 60s, the treatment we had for severe brain injury was surgery. And so we had treatable brain injury that was surgical, and most of them were not treatable because we didn't have a surgical treatment for them. Then along came ICP monitoring, and all patients became treatable traumatic brain injuries. This was a huge revolution. ICP was no longer an anatomic disease, it was a physiologic disease. And this changed everything in traumatic brain injury. It was a true scientific revolution. Neurotrauma, critical care, and the avoidance of secondary insults, since we can't fix primary brain injury, really revolutionized our care for brain injury. Now, this is not neurotrauma as a discipline. This is neurotrauma as a practice. Regardless, it is a neurosurgical discipline. It is also a critical care discipline. But it is this is what really changed brain injury. Unfortunately, the literature missed that and attributed all the changes to ICP monitoring. And the cult of ICP started about three decades ago, where essentially ICP became brain injury and treating ICP was treating brain injury. This is an error, and I'd like to go over that a bit. ICP is a compass, not a destination. ICP is a variable in a larger equation. And this is where multimodality monitoring toward targeted treatment and precision medicine is the future. Now, first of all, the basics. Certainly, protocolization and basic critical care are critical to taking care of these patients. Recently, three consensus-based severe traumatic brain injury algorithms were published. The CREVIS protocol, which was published for patients in the absence of ICP monitoring, CBIC-1, which is for ICP only, and CBIC-2, when ICP monitoring is combined with brain tissue oxygen monitoring. Now, these are open access. I'm not going to go into these in detail. These are readily available, and it, 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 given your interest, you should peruse them and see how they can be used in your practice. I will go through a few key aspects, however. But the first question to ask, is there evidence that following a protocol improves outcome? Well, we were funded to do that. Now, we were funded to do that in a non-monitored environment, but the, the, I think the essentials of the research is quite relevant here. This is in press. It will probably be out in neurosurgery before this video is available. The, the protocol design was to use the previous centers in the best trip trial that were using a protocol, the protocol that we used there in the non-monitored patients, and compare them against a new group of investigators whose centers did not use a brain injury protocol, and then look at the outcomes after 128 patients in each group. We then developed a consensus-based protocol and gave it to both groups and studied the effects of that. Therefore, we had the influence of a new versus old protocol, the new versus no protocol, and then long-term outcomes to look at the, essentially the practice effect of the two protocols. Let's look at the phase one, no protocol against the original protocol. No matter how we measured it, outcome was superior in the group that was treated following a protocol. This is the Kaplan-Meier survival curve, and you can see an early and durable effect on mortality for the use of a protocol. We then got together and did a Delphi-based consensus conference to develop a more advanced treatment protocol. Now, this was not a brand new treatment protocol. This was rather a super imaging and clinical exam protocol, really much more clinically applicable, but rather basically similar to the ICE protocol. It was called the Consensus Revised ICE Protocol. And it was given to both groups, and they employed it uh, in parallel. When we looked at the results, we found that the group that went from no protocol to the, the crevice protocol had results similar to phase one, in that all the, no matter how we measured it, all patients did better. When we look at the group that went from the old protocol to the new protocol, we saw trends in the right direction, but we didn't see anything significant. Not too surprising, since this was really an elaboration of the original protocol, rather than something radically different. 
In summary, what we believe we have demonstrated is that having an institutional protocol save lives, that there is a strong benefit from protocolization, decreasing practice pro uh, uh, variability, getting everybody on the same page. Whether or not the individual protocol is optimal is unclear. That it clearly worked, the ICE or the crevice protocol worked, the, whether or not they are, how they would stand in comparison to other protocols is unclear, but protocolization seems to be beneficial. So what should you do with consensus recommendations? Well, clearly you can ignore them, probably not the best approach, but often done. You can adopt them as they are, a reasonable approach, or you can adapt them, use them as a template and for which you can develop a protocol amenable to your practice environment. But no matter how you do that, you need to do it as a team to get all discipline involved in trauma care, involved in the adaptation of these protocols. Because above all neurosurgical disciplines, trauma is a team sport. Now I'm going to go through a couple of aspects of the protocols because I think they're quite important. First of all is what we call tier, tier zero. This is ICP now, this is ICU management for patients regardless of their intracranial pressure. This is a severe brain injury patient who's admitted to the ICU, the basic care you would expect in the ICU. Endotracheal intubation, analgesia and sedation for things like ventilator asynchrony and pain, not ICP directed. Targeted temperature management below 38 degrees centigrade. Uh, lowest blood transfusion threshold of 7 grams per deciliter hemoglobin. Default CPP target of 60, maintain SpO2 of 94 to 100%, and recommended end tidal CO2 monitoring and insertion of a central line, whereas uh, 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 an arterial line was expected. So these, this is the basic management environment for anyone with severe brain injury, because obviously it isn't just the treatment of ICP that makes these people recover better. The other I issue in the algorithms was the use of tiers, tiered treatment. We could put treatments into first tier, second tier, and third tier. Tiers were ranked by risk-benefit ratio, where tier one was the least risk. So therefore, when possible, the idea is to use the lowest tier treatment. There are three tenets to this. One, there's no rank ordering within a tier. All of the treatments within a tier can be chosen in whatever order the physician chooses. It is not necessary to use all modalities in a tier before moving to the next tier. And finally, if considered advantageous, tiers can be skipped, such as the patient who it is believed needs early decompressive craniectomy, which is a third tier treatment. Now, classic algorithms tended to be each step one choice and then an arrow and advance. The structured algorithm that we use, the tiered algorithm in CBIC, allows multiple choices at each step. This avoids the robotic approach where the treatment that you want may be three or four steps down. It allows choice, but within a structured environment. Using a tiered approach promotes structured treatment while preserving individual decision-making. And this is an example of a tier one where you can see there are multiple choices within tier one. Now, as an example, you can see that targeted treatment fits in there. Based on multimodality monitoring, you may choose an individual treatment in there based on what you suspect is the underlying pathophysiology of the intracranial hypertensive episodes. So this is the root of choice within a structure and will lead, hopefully, will allow better structures in the future based on multimodality monitoring. The other thing about a tier is that when you go from tier to tier, is that inter-tier recommendations, inter-tier considerations become more obvious. When you go from tier one to tier two, it's time to re-examine the treatment environment. Is, is everything the way you think it actually is? Check CPP, blood gas, etc. Are those contusions you deemed non-operative originally, perhaps now operative? What is the intrathoracic or intra-abdominal pressure contribution to ICP? And even consider consultation or transfer to a higher level if that's available in your treatment environment. So it's a good time to stop and rethink things because the patient is proving a little more sick than maybe originally billed. 
Now, the other issue within the, the CBIC algorithms was the use of autoregulation related CPP manipulation. This is the first time that autoregulation tested has been put mainstream into care. It's so broadly discussed now, but not widely made user friendly. This test is done by recording monitoring parameters at the beginning of a challenge, then titrate a vasopressor to increase the mean arterial pressure by 10 millimeters of mercury for about 10 to 20 minutes, and record monitor parameters during and at the close of that interval. Don't change anything else during it so that it doesn't change the ICP. So everything you see is due to the blood pressure manipulation. If what you see looks like this, where elevating the blood pressure, the, the cerebral perfusion pressure, decreases the ICP, then you want evidence of vasoconstriction and the resultant decrease in cerebral blood volume. This will reverse when you titrate off the presser, and you will have evidence of functional static cerebral pressure autoregulation. If this is what you see, a, a, per, a pressure passive response of the ICP, as CPP is elevated, as MAP is elevated, the, the ICP goes up and reverses when you titrate off the presser, you can see evidence of dysfunctional static cerebral pressure autoregulation. So a fairly easy bedside test to allow some assessment of pressure autoregulation. If pressure autoregulation is intact, you can then consider at tier two, raising the cerebral perfusion pressure to lower the ICP by gaining vasoconstriction and decreasing cerebral blood volume. That will not work when autoregulation is out. Also, intact pressure autoregulation tells you that the patient is on the healthier end of the spectrum because a very sick patient will rarely, very rarely have intact pressure autoregulation. That ongoing, at least widespread ischemia is unlikely because metabolic autoregulation trumps pressure autoregulation. And also that the brain can regulate cerebral blood flow as long as CPP is in the range. So the pressure autoregulation can help you perfuse the brain. Now let's talk a little bit about thresholds. Thresholds in medicine come in different flavors. There's injury thresholds, such as when consumption outstrips delivery. Stroke is a good example of that in the brain. There's also physiologic thresholds, such as the lower pressure autoregulation breakpoint. Going below that causes a change in the physiology. It doesn't mean there's ischemia, but it does mean the brain can't autoregulate, so it's a physiologic threshold. And then there are the treatment thresholds that we determine, numbers that we target. Now, of course, nature has no responsibility to our numbers. And that's important to remember because, again, primum non nocere, do no harm. We can overtreat and we can undertreat based on thresholds that we have defined. Let's just look at 22, the current suggested ICP threshold. Is there really evidence for 22 millimeters as a critical value? We, we'll go into that a bit. And then as you go along, uh, why are there not different thresholds for different injuries and different ages? Is a diffusely swollen brain the same as a subdural uh, compressed brain? Or is the threshold, should it be the same at age 15 versus 60? How about over time as the injury progresses and responds to treatment? Do we still use the same threshold? Is compliance response the same? Same with duration and threshold. There's now evidence that the area under the curve is a much better indicator of toxicity than just the numbers or the sum numbers. And we can manipulate cerebral perfusion pressure independent of, an, of a specific ICP threshold. So what exactly is the value and the validity of having this magic number? Now, clearly you need to start safely. You've admitted a fresh patient. You, you don't know much about them. You need numbers, and that, that is particularly when to choose the classic numbers. So that, that's when they're most valuable. But as you manage the patient, use the values and trends of your multiple monitors to figure things out further, and perhaps reconsider some of these thresholds, the underlying pathophysiology and the treatment approaches. Now let's put that in perspective though. We're talking about monitors. What is the most important monitor in this picture? Well, it's the bedside nurse the physiologic monitor that's been there 24 seven and has seen the patient's response to everything that's done, the ICP time course, etc. The best monitor is a neurologic exam. It's not always available. It's not always repeatable, at least reliably, and it can be influenced by outside agents. 
but it's still the best monitor and it's important not to replace it with electronics because in the long run the function of the brain is best demonstrated clinically. Let's take a case to try to illustrate this. Let's say we have a 23 year old male road traffic accident GCS 7 at the scene. He arrives GCS 6T intubated motor 4 Pupils are equal and reactive, vital signs are stable. He's got other injuries, some of which are surgical. These are his images, a diffusely swollen brain, perhaps a Marshall DI3, no mass lesion and no midline shift of, of note. So we put him in the ICU, we tip the head up as far as the pelvic people will let us, and we put in monitors. The ICP is a little high on insertion, he's given uh, hypertonics and it drifts down. The brain tissue oxygen is okay and it tests uh, intact so that it's working properly with FiO2 challenge. Repeat CT is unchanged and the exam is stable. So we're doing so far so good. Six hours later you come back, again you're rechecking. Again the brain tissue oxygen is okay. The ICP has come up and down a bit, it's gone up as high as 24, comes down after hypertonics. The exam remains the same and the pupils remain okay. So again, so far so good. The next morning you come by, again the brain tissue oxygen is fine. The ICP has been a bit of an issue, it's ranged between 12 and 26. It does respond to hypertonics but the serum sodium is starting to get high and so you're beginning to wonder what that, that holds for the future. And the response is not forever, it's two to three hours. The exam is the same, 6T on sedation, and the pupil exam is the same. You repeat the CT to make sure nothing new has gone on. You might see the cistern slightly better, but it's still a diffusely swollen brain. So you're wondering, what will this course look like? What Am I going to get in trouble with the hypertonics? What do I need to do here to make sure that I can adequately manage this patient and not get behind? Well, let's look at what we know. We know that no matter what has happened, the brain tissue oxygen has never dropped to, to a critical level. We know the ICP has ranged. It hasn't ranged particularly high, 26. It does respond to hypertonics, but they don't last forever. We may look at the waveform and we note that P1 is the highest, which is a pretty normal compliance waveform. And we also note that no matter what the ICP has been, the pupils have not changed in their reactivity, including the bedside exam and the NPI. So now what do we do? Well, we might check autoregulation, and let's say this is what we see. We think we have intact pressure autoregulation. So now what do we know? We think there's a low herniation risk. No matter what the ICP has done, we haven't seen compliance changes or pressure on the third nerve. We think there's a low ischemia risk because the patient has auto active autoregulation, and the brain tissue oxygenation has never fluctuated with the ICP. We might also be looking at the EEG for this kind of information. And we know there's intact pressure autoregulation because that also tells us that our patient's probably on the more healthy end of things. So now what we might do is get an exam. It looks like it's safe to do a sedation vacation on this patient. So let's say we back off sedation and we get GCS motor 5, briskly localizing but not following commands. That patient, on a, using a traffic-like metaphor, is a yellow. It's a patient where they're not in trouble, they're not green they're in the middle. You might consider watching them for another 24. You might consider raising the ICP threshold, might be what I would do, to 25, and see if how they do there with the, the pupils and the brain tissue oxygen. But it, it's a pretty good finding. However, what happens if you decrease the sedation and the patient follows commands? Well, I'd consider that a green patient and strongly consider removing the monitors and following them clinically. In a rare case, you may actually have to put the monitor back. But in general, this is using the exam, the best monitor we have, to trump the others. Now let's change it very slightly and see where that leads us. Let's say everything was the same as before, but now the pupils are fine unless the ICP goes up. But when the ICP goes up, the pupillary response becomes worse. You might look at the waveform there and see it's now abnormal, a low compliance brain. This is telling us we can't adjust the threshold, we need tighter ICP control, and we need to optimize the compliance. Sometimes an EVD, if not already in place, can make that kind of difference. You also might want to watch the cerebral blood volume. Another scenario. Here, everything was the same as in the first case, except that 
the brain tissue oxygenation is fine when the ICP is low, but goes down when it goes up. Evidence of ICP-related ischemia. This again requires tighter ICP control, and we need to op optimize the cerebral oxygen delivery. It also may be autoregulation related, and you may want to have some idea of whether or not you're, you're, you're adequately delivering oxygen, your carrying capacity is good, and you might also want to check, definitely want to check, overall resuscitation, because if they're under-resuscitated, this can often happen. Finally, the brain tissue oxygen is never okay. Here we've got a patient who's got intracranial hypertension and a brain tissue oxygen evidence of ischemia. Here we need to treat them very vigorously, check the carrying capacity, check the cerebral perfusion, and check the cerebral metabolic activity. This is really the sickest type of patient and is certainly not anything but a red on the traffic light metaphor. So here, just by combining our monitors, we've come up with four different categories of patients and four different treatment ideas. So we would choose different treatments from within our tiers. Let's remember that ICP subsumes several physiologies. There's the basic, the perfusion, and there's the basic herniation. There might be others, we don't know much about them, but let's just take the two that we, we do understand reasonably well, <clears throat> herniation and CPP, the two great evils in brain injury, which is herniation and ischemia. Herniation is about pressure gradients, and ischemia is about delivery and consumption match matching. Now, they're not fully separable, because obviously if you have high pressure, you're going to drop your blood flow and get ischemia, and if you have ischemia, you'll get edema and raise your pressures. But just conceptually, it is useful to separate them, because it, it optimizes our abilities to target. There are a lot of underlying pathophysiologies that have come out of the laboratory and some out of the clinical situation, and they're a bit confusing. However, they tend to parse reasonably when you think in terms of pressure and delivery, herniation and ischemia. And why is that useful? Because in the interest of precision medicine, if you are having trouble with ICP, you can ask, what is going on here? If there's evidence that herniation might be an issue, based on certain monitors, you can ask what might be the underlying mechanism and target your treatment based on what you think that is within tiers. Same with ischemia. Is there evidence of ischemia? Well, we have monitors that will tell us if there is evidence of ischemia. If there is, you then need to look to try to determine the underlying pathophysiology. And obviously the treatment of anemia will be completely different than the treatment of vasospasm. Or, or seizures. So this again is an opportunity for targeted therapy for specific pathophysiologies. Precision medicine is multimodality monitoring plus pathophysiology targeted treatment. It is not the treatment of numbers. When your intracranial pressure goes up, or for that interest, another of your monitors go off, it is not a target. It is an open door into a dark corridor of multiple potential pathophysiologies. And this is the true root of critical care management of the brain injury, is to try to target the treatment at the underlying pathophysiology. To finish, I want to go back to the team approach. Uh, doing research around the world, such as the ICP trial at all, there is a common theme that comes up in the treatment of brain injury, and that is that intensivists and neurosurgeons don't always get along. Intensivists and neurosurgeons are both absolutely critical to the management of traumatic brain injury, to the successful management. And it, it, of all of the disciplines in neurosurgery, this is the most team approach. So no matter what, communication, uh, agreed protocols, rounding together, uh, avoiding surprises, means that the, the two groups need to work together to optimize the outcome. And, and, and whatever local protocols need to be developed to make your reality a collaborative and cooperative reality between intensive medicine, general surgery, nursing, and neurosurgery, that is the proper approach to managing severe traumatic brain injury. Neurotrauma is still really early in its course. It's still in its infancy. And the exciting and excitement of the future is really something that we need to pick up and run with in neurosurgery. Traumatic brain injury is still a neurosurgical discipline. 
and and the best way indeed to cope with the future is to create it thank you very much